Hey everyone, my name is Suds. And I'm Sabrina. Welcome, Welcome to Zero Calorie Marketing. Today we're joined by Neve, who is the head of content at Fidel. We learn how Neve uses taxidermy, dream journals, and Irish dancing. <laughs> This was a really fun podcast to, for us to conduct, because especially because it was like the last thing we did on the day, and we had a lot of fun talking to Neve. All right, let's begin. I have to ask this question just because Suds wrote it down, and I think it's really funny. <laughs> and it's just I'm right, staring. Don't, don't get the expectations. <laughs> I stare. I just it's 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 it. Could you tell us? About what it's like to live with a name like me. Oh, <laughs> have you I met mean, anyone else called Neve? I have met a few Neves. Um, not that many. I think it's becoming more common, but it is it's difficult. So I think. Uh, I know the guy from Catfish. His name is Neve. The guy from oh, but that's like Nev or something, isn't it? Or he spells it like N E V. Yeah, he spells it yeah. Name, yeah. Um, so it was quite. I would say it was character building as a child. Because the thing that happened is that like at school. And um, when people go, like, if you had a substitute teacher or something and they'd be going through the register, <laughs> the they would, th no, the thing is, I would always, they would just stop when they got to my name and I'd be <laughs> like, and that's Neve. Yeah, so I always knew, like, I didn't even wait for them to try it because there would yeah. just be this long pause and you'd realise, like, oh, that's me. Yes, yeah. this is me. No, Neve, I, I have also have a very complicated name. So my nickname is Suds. Right. But my full name is Silishon. Right. And you can imagine how difficult that is for the, uh, for especially supply teachers. Uh -huh. they, they would just give up. They would just be, this guy, what's his name? This, whoever this yeah. one is. How do you feel about it now? Because now I just kind of will answer to anything that vaguely sounds like an attempt at Neve. The thing is, I've, I've grown to just accept it. Yeah, right, you have to. You can't keep fighting that battle like every day. Every time someone gets it wrong, you... I just can't, I haven't got the energy to correct them. Yeah, mm. The name contains some names and some phonetics that don't exist in the English vocabulary. Oh, well, that's not, I mean, that's not super helpful. Mine at least has all the same letters. It's just that the it's, Irish name, yeah, it's Irish spelled, names, yeah. yeah, they've always, the thing with Irish names is they've always got one trick letter, but you never know, like, which one it's going to be. Yeah, and Siobhan. Siobhan. Yeah, B, oh secret B, no reason for that to be there. Iobi. You know, Iobi, that's, you know. I don't even know that one. I don't know that one either. That was or um, Onya. Oh, yeah. Onya was... Uh, well, my sister's name is Gronya. Gronya. Yeah. That, one, that one's Sinead. less common. Sinead, yeah. Sinead, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> tell us a bit about your childhood, your university, just growing up and how life was. Oh, okay. Um, so, childhood. So, uh, I've got one sister, Gronya, who just mentioned. Um, grew up near Cambridge, where... I have a really, really poor memory, so I don't know if I'm trying to block stuff out from my child, but, but the only things I really remember doing are Irish dancing, which we did like every weekend we would go and compete doing Irish dancing, and going to church, so I was raised good Irish Catholic, so mostly everything revolved around those two things. Um, I, sh I assume we were doing other stuff at some point, but I can't remember. Like, I can't ride a bike or swim, so it was like, I wasn't doing any of that stuff, so I, I figured, I don't know, I think must have, the rest of that time must have just been spent at church, apparently. Um, yeah, fairly average sort of family. Went to school, did fine. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, I then went to uni, uh, did English at uni, which was good. What Can uni did you go to? Went to Oxford. Wow. Mm. You did English language and literature? I did, yeah. I did a gap year, actually, before I went, because I applied to all of the usual places and didn't did get in anywhere. No, I well, went in a pub. Went to Oxford, so that's... I got into Oxford the second time. So the first time I applied, I wanted to go to Oxford, didn't get in, and just thought, oh, I'll, just, I'll, take another, I'll take a year out and reapply. But no, I didn't do any fun travelling. I went and worked in a pub and did another A-level, which was pointless. Wouldn't recommend that. What was A-level in? Uh, so I'd a had previously... <laughs> just a bonus one, yeah. I had previously done... I think I'd done English language, and then I was like, oh, I'll do English literature as well. Ooh. Just got the, get the double in there. Your English is very good. Thanks. Yeah, it kind of needs to be. So, <laughs> few, few mistakes. Yeah. yeah so, so what's your all-time favourite book? Uh, Lolita. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Novikov. Yeah. I think it's all-time favourite book because it's just the first one that like, really kind of like struck me and yeah. sort of stayed with me in that way where you like fall in love with it and it's just yeah. this whole magical experience. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a great book. Um, what is the spiritu 
Taz is trying to pronounce your Instagram, your Instagram handle. Sprezzatura. What is a sprezzatura? Uh, it's an Italian, I don't speak Italian. It's an Italian word that I believe, someone, if someone pulls me up on this now, it's going to be really embarrassing. I think it means the art of like studied kind of lightness and coolness and appearing very, yeah, just cool and unflappable. It's like a studied art of looking cool. <laughs> a studied art of looking cool. Looking cool, That's yeah. Cool. It's deep. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm achieving that either, so. But it's a goal. Uh, so, Neve, you studied English language and literature, mm -hmm. and now you're the head of content for a tech company. Yeah. How did you, when you went to uni, is, did you imagine this is something you'd be doing? No, not what remotely. What did you want to do? Um, so, I don't really tend to think in terms of, I didn't think I had an idea of exactly yeah. what I wanted to do. Hence, English degree, right? Because then you can just do a lot of stuff, is the idea. Um, and when I left uni, I went into TV because I sort of had this vague sense that that would be something I'd enjoy. But I had no experience with it, didn't know anyone in the industry, didn't really know what that looked like. Um, but managed to get into that anyway. And it was quite fun initially, but uh, I did that for about two years, but then realised it wasn't really for me in terms of... No, actually, the opposite. It was all kind of quite fun. Because I was doing like developing game shows, which was just ridiculous. Like you'd spend all day being like, "Can I fit three eggs in my mouth?" And that would be a game show round, which is a laugh, but it wasn't particularly like mentally <laughs> challenging. And also, just there wasn't a lot of structure yeah. about like job security or development and progression or anything like that. Um, so I just had a bit of a panic one day and was just like, oh, "I don't want to do this anymore." Didn't have a backup plan, so just sort of started randomly applying for marketing and PR jobs because that seemed like a relatively decent fit for an English degree. Blagged my way into it. A PR, a very small PR agency, uh, and that was it. That happened to be a tech PR agency, so I started doing tech stuff, and then ended up in the tech world. But I wouldn't like when I was at school. I had uh, it was super precocious, but I had a like cassette player instead of an iPod, primarily because I couldn't afford an iPod, and the one that I had kept breaking. So, but then I was like, I'll just make a thing of this. So I had a cassette player and like loads of tapes, which was really dorky. But the point being, like, I was absolutely terrible with tech. Never been something I was interested in. Um, actually actively quite backwards with tech. Um, so I just sort of fell into the tech world, but then once I ended up there, it turned out I quite liked it. It's quite a nice place to be. Cool. So you're head of content. Yeah. What is content to you in terms of what, what do you do with it? How do you work with it? What, what do you do, basically? That is a good question, yeah. because I think one of the biggest challenges in my job at the moment is kind of trying to explain that to everyone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that in sort of sales, or market, especially sales team, right, if you think how closely the marketing team works with sales, they only understand content insofar as like maybe a case study. Okay. And that would probably be the extent of it. Um, so now what I'm trying to do is to kind of shape their thinking a little bit to help them understand that it's more about crafting this kind of much, it's a lot, much longer play and it's about crafting journeys that we can take people on and creating enough information and not trying to be too persuasive or too salesy, but to like educate them and inform them and help them be better at their own job and to give them resources that they need to you know, genuinely help them so that when they are ready to buy something, like they've got a relationship there, there's a brand that they recognise and trust, and so that they'll kind of think to come back to us, not that it's like they're going to read something and then buy something. Mm. So kind of trying to explain that this is a longer journey, but that it also then has a much longer term sort of positive effects in that that's a customer that you can more easily retain and is more bought into the brand and kind of has a clearer sense of who we are and how we can help them. Um, yeah, kind of, yeah, this kind of more holistic relationship and um, yeah, how we can use that to sort of all the, the whole way along kind of from acquisition to retention. Um, we're going to be covering more of that in the second part of this um, um, meet, um, conversation, meeting. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Become very we'll jump to, um, <laughs> Uh, more about your personal. Um, what is the title of the first? <laughs> Shit. Take two. Um, what is the title of your first novel going to be? Could you tell us the basic outline? Oh God, uh, I don't know if I've got a novel in me. You know how like most people think, yeah, I could write a novel. Short That's story. Thing I could do. Short story. Um, is it about me? Is it like an autobiography, or is it just a, not any because novel? We, I, we, I. I uh, have this theory that anyone who has studied English language and literature at university has gone in with this idea of 
one day becoming a, a great writer. Exactly. No, I think I'm the opposite. I think I uh, need to, <laughs> to do the job that I'm doing because I don't think I have enough like creative vision to come up with any great masterpiece. I think actually, I think a part of me still suspects that if I keep at it long enough, I'll have, actually, do you know what? The book I'm going to write is this. I have thought about this. Well, the book that, I'm gonna... <laughs> that was all a lie. The book I'm going to write is this. Is um, I have quite uh, alarming dreams quite often. They're just like a bit weird and a bit off kilter and often populated by minor celebrities in quite entertaining ways, which I think is because, I read this once, that your brain can't like generate new faces, so it just sort of like pulls things from just various places. So my dreams are often just got this weird cast of like people off TV soaps and people I went to school with when I was like five and just other random people yeah. doing odd things. And I, I've always thought that, like, if I were ever to write an autobiography, instead of just being like, oh, I went to school, I went to university, I fell in love, all of that stuff, I would just write a journal of all my dreams because, A, it's much more interesting than my actual life, and, B, probably, if you're going to get in there and get all psychoanalytical on it, probably reveals a lot more about who I am as a person. Yeah. So, dream journal, and then, you know, people can just let loose on that and tear it apart and probably reveal some awful secrets about my psyche that... Honestly, it would be interesting to know, you know? I'm kind of keen to see what people take from it. So maybe that's it. I agree. Would you read it, do you think? Yeah. My best, I think my best ever celebrity dream moments, cameos were... <laughs> one time I headbutted the Queen, knocked her tooth out, very bad. Um, and another one where Elton John got in our car and started driving the car off and the car lost control and just was all very terrifying. Interesting. This, yeah. We could do a whole podcast. About <laughs> just about my dream. Okay, yeah. I'll start, listen, I'll start with the book and then we can turn it into a podcast. <laughs> Could we buy there. the rights to making a film? <laughs> For the right <laughs> offer, yeah. For the right, right offer. <laughs> Got it. Um, so, obviously you're working, I'm assuming, seven days a week. Five days a week. Five, <laughs> I'm not doing seven. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm just, I'm right thinking right of like the way you're five days a week, my mistake. Um, you you might have some sort of routine in place, but how do you balance your work life and your personal life? And like, what sort of gets you up in the morning? What inspires you? That's really good. So I think what I like about my current role um, is that I get a lot of control over it. So I can work more or work less or whatever, but it's up to me to set like what I think I want to achieve and what the target should be uh, and to make that happen. Um, so arguably I could take that as an excuse to sort of just do a bit less or set less ambitious goals but for me I am someone who like takes pride in my work and the reason I'm doing this job is because I actually really enjoy it so being able to set my own strategy and work out you know decide exactly what the work is I'm going to do means that I can then just do stuff that I want to do and enjoy so actually I can just get up and go to work for the love of doing the thing that I genuinely am quite excited about and yeah it probably sounds quite nerdy but for instance, today we had a meeting about video and uh, how we might be able to use video. Uh, and now I'm just like, yeah, let's make some videos. So then, you know, tomorrow I want to go to work because I want to get to start on that stuff. So that helps. Um, main thing, I don't know, the other stuff I get out of bed for is just breakfast. That's, like, that's always helpful. Um, I've started trying to do like yoga or some sort of exercise in the mornings, but it's, that is a real mixed bag of results there. Some days it's like, oh, God, yeah, I'm so zen. And I use ClassPass and you get charged like... 12 quid if you cancel it, which is a lot. And I've run up so much, like so many charges with classes where I've woke up, like booked a class at like 7 a.m. because I think I'm going to be that person. It gets to like six when my alarm goes off and I'm just like, absolutely not a chance. But now I'm much poorer for that. <laughs> sort of swings it's around about. It's a great about. motivation to... It's not. I thought it would be, this is why I got it, because I thought it would be more of a motivation to like, well, you don't want to get all of these fees, yeah. go to the gym. It's not working. So I'm still like, still not exercising Checking anymore, <laughs> and it's made yet. Now I'm losing money. Uh, Is that? I didn't know that's how class pass works. Yeah, it's a racket. I'm telling you, it's really because also when I first got it, I didn't realise that was what was happening. So I just kept cancelling loads of classes, and I, it was only after like, I cancelled literally, me? literally like five or six, and I got this bill for like sixty quid. Yeah, I was I'm just like, going. Oh. I won't swear. But um, the transition from. You said you're doing film and, and TV and yeah. The transition from that to then like tech. Yeah. Did you you, you went via PR? Went via yeah. PR. Did you have any like major fears or nervous? Like how how did you sort of make that change and um, how did you sort of like put yourself into this new environment of work? Yeah. Um... Let's think, how did I do that? 
So I think with the so kind of transitioning into, the, I mean, the first little PR agency that I went and worked in, that was proper. It wasn't even imposter syndrome because I actively was an imposter. Like literally, they'd uh, in the job description they'd said like we want someone with two years experience in this and a couple of years experience in that. And I, I mean, I had been upfront about it, but in this cover letter, I was like, I can't do any of those things, but I can do these things, and that seemed to work. So I guess there was that that I hadn't, you know, lied about it, and I knew that they were bringing me in to sort of train me up a bit. Um, and then I don't think it what when I then moved that I only was only there for a year and then when I moved in house into a tech company to do like take on more of the content I think it was actually just pure ignorance that got me through it because if I think if I'd realized how big of a change it was going to be and how much there was to learn and actually how little I knew about tech marketing working inside a business because I'd been agency side before like I literally knew nothing about it but I didn't know what I didn't know so I wasn't worried about it <laughs> until I got there yeah, because you know what you've you've gone from uh, TV PR and now it's tech or mm. content. For most people, this is a very big leap in a way. How did you, if anyone's thinking of doing this, what advice would you give them? Um, don't do that, yeah. Um, no, I think that, I mean, it doesn't feel like that big of a leap to me. They do feel like kind of a natural progression because I think it, the heart of all of them was for me, writing, but in like more broadly speaking, it was kind of like the ability to identify a narrative and to tell a story in the way that people uh, will respond to. So like for the, the job that I was doing in TV, it was developing game shows, which does sound stupid. Like, like I said, like how many eggs can you fit in your mouth, right? But like no one's just gonna watch 15 rounds of that. You have to like build it into a story arc and there has to be jeopardy and there has to be, you know, something at stake and stuff for people to like engage with and a journey for them to go on. And in a much, arguably less interesting way than the egg thing. Like, that is still what I'm doing now in the content that I'm creating. Maybe I should do some sort of egg content for Fidel, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that's basically always been, and it was the same with PR, is about, I can give you a, you know, if we're doing a, P, a press release for a tech company, anyone can sit there and see, like, these are the benefits of the company, here's what it does, who, here's who runs it. But it's being able to turn that into something that actually is compelling and talk about it in a way that an audience is going to care about that mm. is, you know, the value there. So I think that's kind of been a common thread through all of them that's just been applied in different ways. See all the teachings from the university has... See, I do, see, it all, it's all coming together in a beautiful loop. Um, okay. So in terms of, like, you've had, you sort of dipped your toe into a few different things. If you could do anything else apart from taxi <laughs> um <laughs> What else would do you, could you see yourself do apart from what you're doing right now? Like in the tech marketing world or anything at Any, all? Anything. Um, I, I don't know. I think like, yeah, I, I'm actually doing the thing that I wanted to do, so that helps. Um, if I were to do anything else, I think it would be completely different. And the only thing I've ever, the only idea I've ever entertained, which is so, I don't think I would ever do it, but is... Um, like being some sort of like prison counsellor. So this is something that my dad did like years and years ago when I was a little kid, like as a volunteer. But I do, in general, I think that like I'm quite interested in sort of like prison reform and I think that that's another area where there's a lot of like politics and sort of philosophy almost because of the way that it, you know, other specific groups are disadvantaged or, the, you know, there's a lot of power dynamics and stuff and it's obviously a very flawed system. Um, yeah, and I think that's kind of a cool thing to do to like look at the individuals in that system and then try to help them rather than just being like, all criminals are bad and just need to be locked up. So I've always thought that would be a very interesting and worthwhile thing to do, but I don't think I'm... I actually don't think I'm nice enough to do that. So oh, maybe, maybe, maybe one day. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> Shall we move into some marketing questions? Yes. Oh, right. oh, what about um, the best friend? Oh, yeah, okay. So... Your best friend has decided to launch a new business and mm -hmm. asks your advice on marketing. What is the first thing you say? Pay me. No, I wouldn't <laughs> say that. Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think that the main problem that people have with marketing, or well, the people don't understand about marketing, is that it is uh, not one thing. Mm. Like again, if you think about the way that mar marketing works really closely with sales, sales is essentially kind of one thing where you have a lot of people doing, maybe in different industries or whatever, but you've got like, you know, 10 salesmen, they're all essentially doing the same thing. If we've got a team of 10 marketers, they're all probably doing completely different things. So I suppose my advice would be to figure out like, where do you need to start? How, you know, do you actually understand the kind of different areas this touches? Mm -hmm. What is it you're trying to achieve? 
um, and then pay me. And then pay And leading on to that, what would you say is one of your biggest frustrations with like marketing, digital marketing? Um, I think because it's so it's actually also the thing that I enjoy about it, especially working in a startup environment where you are doing bits of everything. Um, because that just because there is so much to do and it covers such a broad spectrum of things, that it's quite difficult to do a lot of stuff quickly. Like you've really got to do a lot, spend a lot of time like setting mm. up processes and laying foundations and educating other team members and getting people bought in and all of that stuff. Um, and so you're kind of doing like lots of different things at once and you can only shuffle them forward quite slowly often. Um, but it's not just a case of like adding bodies. Yeah. Um, so it's great because, like, yeah, for me in a startup, I get to do little bits of all of those things. But it's also frustrating because, you know, there's just so much to do. Do you ever have any like moments where, why? Well, because you're saying you're in a startup, like it's just, wow, this is really not working. This is the end. Or, what have we done? Like how? I think it, it must be quite terrifying being in a startup, just because you don't really have any. You're not in a corporate. You're not in a big company. How did? How do you deal with like those situations where you're kind of maybe something's not gone right? Well, maybe you haven't experienced that, but so I think kind of two parts to this. One is that um, I don't think I have. Like, that's what I like about it yeah, in the cool. current role is like, and the reason I kind of left my last place was because I didn't have enough room to just try the stuff that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and so I've gone into this place with. Basically, just my I like I've got a really clear idea of what I want to do. I've no idea if it's actually the right thing to do. I think it is, and it seems to be working quite well and like aligning with what other people think is the right idea. Um, but that's what I quite like about it is just being able to like set stuff up, and because it is a startup, um, you're not inheriting other people's systems, and you're not already walking into huge goals that you don't know how to meet. So like we're kind of setting it all up as we go at and your pace. at your own pace. Yeah. yeah, which is admittedly fairly breakneck, but we're not. Um, we've got time to set that stuff up and do it properly and work out how to do it properly bef before we're supposed to be hitting like crazy targets. Sure. Um, but the other side of it is like the stuff, the thing that's frustrating about it is not not being able to achieve things. It's just that everything that we want to achieve inevitably takes a lot longer than you think it's going to because what I found is you have to start kind of like with everything. You have to start like five steps back from where you thought you were going to. So for instance, um, something that I've been working on the last month or so was I realized like oh, I want to build a messaging house because I know we can talk about these topics, but I maybe want to start to think about what other topic areas we could own and build some content around. So that seemed like that was going to be a fairly straightforward job of just like, well, we'll do messaging house, we'll work out what our kind of value propositions are, we'll build topics around those, job done. But then in trying to do that, realized that actually across the business, there was quite a variety of ideas about what our value propositions were or what industries we were targeting or which personas. So now we've had to kind of go several steps back to like just start our messaging again. And that means like talking to everyone internally to get their idea about what we think we're doing, talking to customers to see if that's what they're hearing or if they're buying for totally different reasons, then get everyone aligned around, you know, what the actual, you know, the validated uh, messaging is and then apply it into a, into a messaging house. So like this job that I thought was going to take me a week to do a messaging house is actually now like a quarter's worth of work and a whole project that involves the whole company. <laughs> so it's like everything kind of ends up taking on that like much bigger scope and much longer timeline. So yeah. it, it just takes a while to get stuff done. But then it's quite nice to be able to have a hand in actually mm -hmm. like everything from scratch so that when it comes to me, it's not coming to me half-baked by someone that I didn't understand. It's like I've gone away and built that and now I can use it. Exactly. So it takes a while, but I find that quite enjoyable to just kind of have that ownership over it. Um, so it's something very interesting you said. In terms of like all the parties that you're listening, you, know, you have to listen to, uh, how do you put a weight on whose opinion you should value more? Yeah, that is an interesting one. Um, it's quite, I think it is quite tricky, like as a marketer, we have to listen to the market, and that's actually quite difficult. To ever, I don't think you can ever really get close enough because for us to even talk to our customers, it's like we've got to go through customer success, we've got to go through sales. We're not like the front line of people that are really engaging with the market every day. Even like, And we can try and build up processes there, but there's always kind of like one step removed. Um, and also then there's just... And ditto with like all of our internal teams, especially sales, Like we obviously want to help them and to empower them, but... There's always this thing of with you know both of those parties that yes they have an idea of what they think and what they think they want but they might not again they might not know what they 
don't know. So you kind of have to take it with a pinch of salt and be like, I know you think you want this, but I think actually this would be better for you. So it's always kind of like trying to massage those two things, but not to let your own bias get in the way. And then for us, you know, our co-founder, because the company's really small, our co-founders are very involved and it's like, it's their baby. So, you know, ultimately the way that they see it um, can be quite different. And that's actually been really nice this quarter as part of this messaging project to like really sit down with our co-founders and hear them tell the story of the company because they know it best. And actually it completely changed my view of what, what I thought we were and where I thought we were going. Um, so yeah, you do get different versions of it from everywhere. But I think the things you have to look for are like the points of convergence because then you kind of know like, oh, okay, well this is something that we can all agree on and how do we move that forward? Um, but yeah, it's tricky. I think sometimes you end up with two completely opposing things and they're just like, don't really know how to bring them together, but I think that's just kind of an ongoing process of like continually setting up those feedback loops and just trying to nudge it forward a little bit at a time. And it shouldn't be something that you have to like start from scratch and just redo time and again, like then something is not working. But I think it should be this process of like constant iteration to get it closer and more refined and more effective. What are some of your biggest frustrations? Um, if you have any. I think that, <coughs> so I think, yeah, it's probably getting people um, bought in to content. So the good thing about when I joined my current company is like none of this existed beforehand. So I kind of knew I was going to have probably a three month grace period where I could get stuff set up before people started asking for content because they didn't know that they wanted it yet. <laughs> so like that was quite nice, but I kind of knew that the day was coming where they'd be like, oh, actually, I've seen this, that was quite good, can I have another one of them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but then they kind of, again, they kind of just have this one idea of like, I want that. And maybe that isn't the right thing that they need or they haven't. I used to get it at my old company as well. Everyone would just come up to me and ask me for a press release. And I was like, why do you want a press release? This is not a press, this isn't a news story. Like, that's not the thing that you want. Or they want a blog. Yeah. And it's like, no, okay, what is it that you're trying to, and so you have to kind of go, okay, what is it you're trying to achieve? Who is this for? maybe what you want actually is this video or this like ebook or whatever it is but it's like you probably don't want a press release so like but people they will come and ask you, ask you for like i want this thing and so like having to just like re-educate people about actually how this works and that it is a longer journey and that different pieces of content work in different ways and maybe it's not the thing that you think you want but i promise you it is still useful like that is that can be just quite a challenge because i like for instance at the moment if i sort of every piece of content that i create i share with the whole team to get them to share it. And they'll just be like, sometimes they'll be like, I don't know what this is, this is not useful to me. And so then you have to explain like, no, well it's not, you know, it's not for the conversation that you're having right now, it's for this different earlier conversation, but eventually that will bring people to you and just kind of, they, you having to get them to see that longer picture and to not think so short term that it's like, deliver one piece of content, customer buys, like just that kind of re-education piece and bringing people along on that journey is, can be quite difficult. Um. Some, in terms of like, I know it, it sounds like you're, uh, you've entered into some sort of like a blank canvas situation where yeah. you're creating things as you as you go. Yeah. Um, not in a you know not improvising things, but you know you're having to uh, assess the situation as it is, and then coming up with ideas, and, you know maybe even coming up with best practices that you've had from your previous role. Um, do you think your life would have been easier if you had? have had some kind of, not boundaries, but some set parameters or some kind of um, strategy that you could have either entered into or you could have said, okay, this, is, this was the strategy, we're not going to do this, or this may have changed. Yeah, definitely. So I think especially at my, because I, so I mentioned when I started at my last company, which is my first like in-house tech company kind of content role, um, I really didn't know what I didn't know and I'd never worked in-house and I'd never worked in a marketing team and I honestly had no idea what I was doing. Um, but because that was also a startup and fairly early stage, there wasn't really anyone else there that knew about this particular thing either. Like the marketing team was quite young, certainly nobody had done content. And so it took me quite a long time to figure out, just to figure out like what the point of it was and what I was trying to, because I kind of went in and you just sort of start, and I think actually a lot of companies do this, companies that are a lot more mature, but it's quite an easy trap to fall into. We were just like writing a blog a week, but not really sure why or like what the point of that is, but you're just doing it because you feel that you should be doing it. So I think we spent quite a lot, a long time kind of in that area where I was like, I'm producing stuff, but I really don't, I can't is, really work out. Thing. Yeah. And I kind of didn't really have a clear idea of what I was trying to do with it. I just sort of had this sense that it was something I was supposed to be doing. 
And that, um, and then I remember being asked to write a content strategy, and I was literally just like, "The fuck is in a content strategy?" Like I don't know. And I was googling like what goes in a content strategy, and there was just like no resource for this, and that was super frustrating because I kind of had, yeah, I just had these kind of collection of vague ideas of like things that I thought I wanted to achieve, or like just the start of understanding of things, but no way to understand how to bring it together or how to make it useful or anyone to ask. And so it, uh, that, and I, now I think that's really influenced the way that I think about creating content now is like what would have been so useful for me at that time or what I really wanted was just like something that just practically tells me how to do this thing that I need to do and so all of the content that I create now I try and focus it on that like how to make someone better at their job and like to give them practical practical advice because a lot of content out there is just like here is an overview of this topic and there's like 50 companies that have done basically the same overview of that mm. topic and it doesn't get you any closer to being able to actually use that information so that is what I constantly have in mind is like, make this useful to people because there are, like, there are so many people who are like me at that time just being like, just, because all the content that I found was like, you need to have a content strategy. And I was like, yes, I know I, know I need to have one, <laughs> but no one will tell me how to build one. Yeah. And that is what I want is how to do it, not just this vague sense that you should do something in this area. Yeah. So yeah, it would have been super useful to have that. Um, I guess now it's been quite a nice journey to just be like, well, I figured it out by myself. But again, I'm still, still a lot of it for that reason is quite untested. So it's me just thinking like, well, I've got this far and I think from having kind of like struggled to get here, I think I now know what I need. I might be wrong because <laughs> again, I, haven't re I still haven't got that much kind of guidance on it, but I don't know, it's all an adventure. So from the sound circuit, you know, like, uh, a lot of your, what you do is tied to your personality in terms of you believing doing things because they're the right things to do rather than doing things because that's how things have always been. A lot of, yeah. a lot of thought put into it. Yeah, and I think ultimately that's why I got out of TV um, is because I wasn't... Like, I like being challenged and I like challenging myself and, like, learning new stuff. And I could have, yeah, I could have stayed in TV and just been like, here is how you do a game show, but it wasn't challenging me. And the same with content, I could have just carried on being like, you do a blog a week, but like, I couldn't see the outcome of that or the output or why that was impactful or what it was for. And so I found that frustrating because then you can't, can't get any better at it. Um, so for me, like, just having like, a problem to solve and to be able to feel that I'm challenging myself and I'm learning is like, kind of my constant motivation but in work and in life, broadly. What's one of the greatest things or proudest things you've sort of Curate, like curated, like you, it was a big sort of obstacle that you needed to come up with or sort of figure out, and you did it. In work or just in general? Yeah, yeah. Well, in general, work, whatever. Um, in terms of like content, content, content strategy yeah. Or... I think. Yeah. So I think um, just kind of the whole process of like building the content strategy out my last company but sort of just doing it in a way where I felt I was like fumbling about it was almost like you're building something in a dark room and you couldn't really see what you were putting together but you had this vague sense you were building something um touch. yeah pretty much and just sort of like feeling it out um so I'm kind of quite proud that that ended up being you know just anything that we even worked remotely yeah. so that in of itself um and though I think individual pieces along the way that I was like I am really pleased with this this was a really cool idea and there was like actually they haven't published it so I won't talk about it but there was like quite a big piece of content that I like left mostly done when I left there and was like this is my gift um where I mean I don't know maybe it wasn't any good maybe that's why they haven't used it but like um but that was another one where it was kind of like it was a new format for that company it wasn't something they'd done before if it had been used correctly it could have been something where it's like really effective and really impactful and something they could have repeated year on year and so I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm glad I've done that. Mm -hmm. And then I left. <laughs> that was it. I did my thing. No, I was I out. Yeah. <laughs> like one of those flash bombs. Yeah, yeah it was a probably like drop. mic drop. Yeah, that was <laughs> it. <laughs> Bam, I'm out. No, that's great. Blue that's really drop, interesting. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pen. It doesn't make quite such a satisfying noise. You just drop the pen. That's really interesting. This, you know what they say about like the pen being mightier than the sword. Right, exactly. Mm. Killed a couple of people on the way down. It was really <laughs> lethal. Um... How has social media as a marketing platform benefited your business company? Well, you know, like how much of social media do you need to yeah. take into account whenever you're creating a piece of content? Mm. So I like. How much does it come into 
Yeah, and, like in my personal life, it's not something I really use that much. Mm -hmm. uh, or like I'm just a lurker, right? So like I, ha I have a Twitter account, I have no tweets. You have two <laughs> tweets on your oh, do Twitter. I? I thought I'd delete them all. Damn, what are they? Is it like, Topshop, please might fix my boats? I'm like, like I bet they're complaining them. tweets. But I don't think I'd ever have the courage to tweet something out yeah. there. Yeah, well, yeah. I think it was uh, Justin Bieber, MCC. <laughs> I love you, why won't you record my call? Cool. Uh, yeah, it sounds about right. I wrote you a piece of content and you never returned <laughs> <laughs> my letter. <laughs> I'm writing a novel. <laughs> I'm um, writing a novel and I saw you in my novel. <laughs> <laughs> it was in my dream, dream. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't use it that much. Um, so it's always one of those... In fact, the reason I deleted my Twitter is because what it had on there was like every time I was applying for a job, basically from the point I left uni, I was like, you need to be active on social. So I'd just have like a couple of months where I was clearly just in job applying process yeah. where I'd have these like absolute nonsense tweets that were just worthless. Then it would stop again for like two years. And then when I was looking for another job, we'd be like, oh, better start tweeting again. <laughs> um, so I deleted it because it looked stupid. Um, so it's not something, I feel like some people are like, they're really good at it naturally and it's a thing they really understand and are happy to put a lot of energy into, where for me it's always been a bit of an effort. Um, so it's not something that I enjoy, but it is something that's clearly useful. Um, and so one of the things, the first things I did when I joined Fidel was um, A, to just like get some content production underway, but B, to get um, just like a consistent organic distribution process. So like every piece of content was going out you know, the same number of times in the same places so that we could actually then start to compare them and see, like, well, which ones perform better because mm -hmm. no good seeing, like, oh, this blog got 10 views and that one got 100 mm -hmm. if it was like, well, yeah, well, the one you post you got, that, got 100, you posted, like, 50 times yeah. or whatever. Um, so just trying to... That was the main way that I used social was more of, as a tool to understand my content mm -hmm. so that if I'm putting it all in the same place at, you know, the same time, then it's at least you've got some sort of a level playing field where you can start to see, okay, well, which one got more engagements. Yeah. And because we're still early, quite early stage and are still working on like defining our personas and validating them, um, you know, if I had that already, I wouldn't ne necessarily need to do this kind of testing. But because I don't, it's like, well, what's a kind of replacement for that in the interim? And it's like, well, I can use social as a bit of a testing ground to see like what are people responding to and you know, how can we use that information and then you know, scale up those things that are working or drop the things that aren't. Um, so that's, that's been quite useful as like a kind of surrogate for having more information. So you've now been in marketing content for three years now, two years now? Uh, about three, yeah, probably about uh, three and a four, three or four? Months. God, I don't know. Yeah, yeah three, probably. And I think like even within the last two, three years, there's been like a great change in just the way content is, is being made and sort of produced, if you will. Consumed as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How have you sort of kept up with that change in the industry, if you will, or, or like, yeah. the way it's, it's, it's very, you know, sometimes it's, it has a, a trend and it's always changed. So how, yeah. how are you keeping up with that? Yeah, um, I think you're right, it has changed enormously. Like even just, and content marketing as a discipline has yeah. grown a lot. Like for instance now, if I Google how to make a content strategy, loads of stuff out there about how to do it, which I really well, we could have used. create something, how to create You should, like it's useful. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. say like literally what needs to be in it, that is what you need like to know. Like how to do it. How to do it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think content marketing as like a discipline has moved on a lot, which is nice. Um, and I do try and keep up with, you know, what other people are doing, but... Um, I still think a lot of it's really crap um, and that was kind of yeah that's the other thing about like you were saying earlier about I don't just I try not to just do things because that's like the way it's done um, feels right. yeah because I think a lot of like yeah for instance case studies um, there's like a really formulate way you can do case studies and that's kind of just the way they've been done since the dawn of time mm. but they're a bit crap like they're a bit boring to read and they're not re-engaging and like they serve one purpose someone will read it once and go okay yeah it ticks that box of the thing I need this bit of software to do, but they're not going to share it, they're not going to remember it. Yeah. Um, so like, why, why stick to that format? So then it's like, well, just how do you just make it something that people want to watch? And I think that's kind of my, or read or whatever. And that kind of is my sort of general philosophy. And I think the same goes for like stuff with SEO, like the algorithms keep changing or trends, they keep changing, the channels people use, they keep changing. Yeah. There's no point in trying to like chase that. Sure. I think as long as you can create content that you genuinely think, when someone lands here, they will read it or they will watch it because it's just good, it's good. Like it's got a good story or it's well produced or it's useful. Mm. Then it doesn't really matter what the other things are. 
it will be effective. And I, I think that's just like, because then everything, well, maybe this is just me being lazy and I'm like, well, then I don't have to worry about the trends. But it does, I think that just generally means it's like going to be kind of evergreen rather than trying to write something that's like super keyword stuffed or because it just like ultimately they'll change the algorithms anyway. So what's the point? Um, so I just think like just do stuff that's good. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it is a lot of B2B literature, I guess. Is it like a genre in itself, you know, where um, this is the formula of how you write a horror or a B2C content or a you know, B2B? Yeah. And I think that's what the problem with it is, is that uh, there's just, with so many of like particular formats, like people just see it as, or a lot of companies tend to do it in just like, that's the way you do that bit of content, and therefore that's what they do. Mm. Um, instead of actually, and this is where I think my background in TV or having done an English degree or whatever, and thinking more about it in terms of like narrative or storytelling is like, yeah, you don't have to just do the case study the way that B2B does case studies. Like, why not take influence from chicken shop videos or whatever it is? Like, because they're stuff that you enjoy watching. So at the end of the day, you're still selling to people. And so just, you don't have to like stick to this. And I think the other thing is like, A, it tends to be a bit like the content itself can be a bit turgid, but there's also like a lot of it is, um, looks awful like just a lot of really boring looking it's the same thing. websites yeah just like not using images in a particularly good way or you know, just not making it engaging it's like when you're the person who's consuming or reading your piece of content is a human being who is probably on their phone and the one minute they're watching a uh, viral video the next minute they're sort of reading about your company i just feel that marketers, especially in the B2B world, they tend to just think, okay, no, there's suddenly going to be in a different persona or they're going to be in a different mode where they think this should have bullet points and this should have a quote or this should have yeah. this. Um, and it's this kind of frustration where the same person who's literally just stopped watching Dancing on Ice or Strictly from Dancing isn't going to suddenly put on a business, business hat yeah. and say, I want to consume professionally um, written content, mm -hmm. but in a written in a way that is very convoluted yeah, and yeah. very formulaic that I expect this kind of content to be rather than um, I want to be insane yeah. or I want to, mm. I want something relatable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes it is a hard balance to strike because there is an element of needing to deliver something that people will like recognize and think that they want and especially for like for my company now like we deal with a lot of personal like financial data which is really sensitive so like we have to be careful of being like too informal or too flippant or you know you have to be conscious of the tone but that's not to say that you can't still make it entertaining or you know i don't think it's like um not about your current company but it's almost like uh you don't have to constantly play to uh, people's traditions. Yeah. yeah, or you don't have to. You don't have to um, suddenly just say, okay, this is how we're going to interact with our customers, and this is the only way to do things. Mm. Whereas there's a whole spectrum of yeah. ways you can express yourself without having to be too informal or too formal. There is always this kind of middle ground. Um, I think we've gotten to like this bubble of. We've got like forms of creativity that we just stick to, yeah. and we haven't like got out of it in terms of let's take a new approach, let's sort of create something differently, but still get the same message across, which is an interesting space to sort of play around with now. But I mean, if I just think about all, all the videos I get on my feed, just for example, adverts or just like like targeted things. It's all format. It's very, mm. yeah. it's very, you know, the same. We're all like prisoners to yeah. our own uh, ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that um, is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. In terms and of for example, even like an environmental video, which is a great concept, but it's all that same stuff. So really sad. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> so stock footage of some penguins. Yeah. And, yeah. I feel like if you, if even a video that would have some sort of involvement. Of inspiration get involved like that is just a different take of it yeah i don't even see anything like that it's all the same like melting ice caps which yes it's a thing it's happening but 
yeah. all the same. It's tricky, I think, as well, because uh, I, don't, I don't in any way like blame people for doing things the way that works. Because like, sure, 100%. one thing is like it's very difficult to sell. I mean, when it's difficult to sell content at all, it's even harder to sell. Like, mm. let's do it in this crazy way, like sure. up the chain. But then the other thing is that, like, especially when you're working inside a business, like, it's not always a super creative space, right? It's like yeah. it's very busy and it's crowded and you're trying to deal with whatever meetings. And you know what's safe as well. Yeah. So I mean, I think maybe that's just like I think as I. I mean, the company at the moment is really small, but like, if that were to grow uh, in the future, what I'd really like the dream would be to have some sort of like little like content studio that's almost like, you know, where you can have that more creative atmosphere yeah. that's almost kind of set apart. Not, you know, you still want to be integrated within the yeah. business, but like a far enough apart that you can still have it be a creative yeah. space rather than something that's like restricted by like making a sale or having a meeting or whatever. Um, so almost going more towards the art rather than science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can express yourself in any way you yeah. choose to, as long as it is, you know, within some sort of sensible barrier. Yeah. Or without you being too restricted. Sure. You know, yeah. You know, it's so almost like having a play, but the same things happen, but the script you're feeding the actor is. is yeah. Different. Well, I think that's like why I kind of ended up in the role that I'm in instead of just doing like for instance just like being a straight copywriter or sport something or journalist or something like that um it's because I like that mix of like having the structure to work within and having yeah. um like a clear idea of the strategy and like knowing it needs to fit a certain you know fit a certain need within the business but then you also get the creative side yeah, of like but I need the like I need the structure I'm not going to write this novel <laughs> so yeah. I mean I'm going to say it's, it's good training for your novel for my novel <laughs> yeah but I need the structure of my dreams I can't just have like a blank yeah. page I don't know what to do with that um, but yeah so I think that kind of like balance is really like works it well works for me well, yeah. but it's just about getting the right balance within the business so you've got enough space to be creative but it still kind of meets right. some business cool. expectation cool Shall we move on to our second last question? Yes. What three tips would you give to someone starting out in the marketing industry? In marketing? Yeah. Or your field? In content yeah. marketing. Um, so, yeah, I suppose the first one would be, like, one would be just to make sure that your constant goal, or whatever else you're doing or whatever else the business requires, is, like, if you're doing content marketing, it's probably because you've got an interest in the content itself or writing or narrative or whatever it is, like hang on to that and like blow open saying like don't lose that kind of creative side of it and just think that you have to fit these formulate moulds. Um, because ultimately that will be what sets your content apart is if it's actually good. Um, so that'd be the first one, I think the most important one. The second one I think for content marketing is to make sure that it does have some structure. So I think for me the turning like I said at my last place, it was just a lot of fumbling about in the dark. But the real turning point was when I we got a, a lead generation person in. Um, and like partnering with her, because I think content can serve like so many different parts of the business and serve so many different needs that it's you just feel like yeah you're just doing these kind of random bits and pieces here and there but they're not really adding up to very much. Mm -hmm. And so like when I started to work very closely with like lead generation, it was like right well we've got a campaign and this campaign is going to these people and it needs to have this many touch points and they need to go on these channels. Mm -hmm. So then it was like cool. So then I know we need X Y Z and it needs to be about this topic and like that just gave me like so much more structure to to have a clear idea of like right that's what that's what we need because we're working towards this outcome. So that was really helpful. So I suppose, like, set one goal or partner up with one part of the business to make sure, like, that is what you're doing your content for rather than just trying to do, like, bits of content for everyone because that won't really get you very far. And then third thing would be... Content strategy. Have it yet. Like, <laughs> I think, yeah, just do as much reading as you can. Um, it is out there now. So, like, take advice. Find... I think the thing that I do now is that I've got two or three... Um, Kind of companies that I go to a lot for, and just read their content about content, and now they're my like go to. So like, find your ones of those and read them, whether it's people or blogs or other businesses, um, and then try and be one of them. <laughs> and that's like that's the goal. Oh, that's great. actually, that if I could have one. Last sure, question. sure. Um, if what are the companies that you look for? Uh, to draw inspiration from? Yeah, so the companies that I there are a couple of different versions of that. So one is like companies where I think their content is good. Um, and I suppose like the one that everyone talks about in we're kind of broadly in the fintech space is Monzo. Like everyone loves Monzo. Yeah. They've got like really good brand, good content, good tone, all of that stuff. Um, and the other ones that I think do content well, kind of in the top tech space, are like Intercom does really good content. We kind of look at them quite a lot. Um, there are probably others I'm forgetting now. But then on the content side, like the places I go to to get 
my advice about how to do content. It's um, I tend to go to Contently. I think their stuff's really good. Oh, yeah. um, HubSpot's got a lot of good stuff. Um, again, there's probably another one that I'm forgetting. But um, yeah, there are kind of like, I think once you kind of find those one or two, and this, but then again, this just proves the value of content to me because yeah. <laughs> it's like, I will go back to those, yeah. them, like time and time and time again to just find my next bit of reading into, um, like they really, inf they really, I mean, I haven't bought, have we bought HubSpot? We haven't bought Contently, but like, they have managed to like completely, good content will shape your thinking on a thing. It doesn't just like report to you or mm. um, give you an overview. It like will help you make a decision and help mm. you develop. So um, they're the people I'll go back to time That's again. Great. Yeah, Buff is pretty good, I found. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they are had, good. They had this superstar writer. I think she left to go and do something else. But she was almost like a, the, the, her work could, you know, her piece, piece of blog post could almost be like a, magazine article yeah. that you pay to read. And I think she went to do something else. Um, I, I don't think she's doing any content for B2B or she's not writing. Maybe she's gone back to writing a novel. I hope <laughs> um, she has, that's it. She's taken a time out. Or she originally wanted to do. Um, <laughs> but it was just, every time she would tweet out, it was just it was yeah. amazing stuff. Well, I think we all have that thing where it's like, I've got so much, so many newsletters that I've subscribed to because in general, I think, yes, I am interested in it. But the majority of those go in the bin. But I think we've probably all got that one or two where you're like, oh, no, actually, every Friday I do read this one because yeah. that one is actually good. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you crack that. But I feel like I've just said, like, just do it good, which is, like, <laughs> what I complained about earlier is, like, but how? But um, <laughs> that, is, I, that I don't have the answer to. Just got to feel it out. You don't figure it out. Cool. Um, the last thing is, what is the best way to get in touch with me? What's the best way? The best way to get in touch with me uh, is on LinkedIn, uh, cool. where I think I'm just Neve Cassidy. But anyway, you'll find me at, under Fidel. Cool. So this is our rapid fire questions, starting now. So it's just whatever the first thing comes to mind, answer it, go. And yeah. Okay. Would you rather have a beach break or a city one? City break. Card or cash? Card. Summer or winter? Mm, summer, but I get very sunburnt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Lots of sunburn for you. <laughs> Morning, noon or night? Uh, night. Pepsi or Coke? Coke. Favourite TV show of all time? 30 Rock. Mm. Oh, very good. Oh, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's go that. What was what? the second favourite? Yeah. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Oh. It's quite niche. Okay. It's very funny, I do recommend I that. Have to look yeah. into it. Is it British? Yeah, it's a British comedy. It's got, you know, like um, Matt Berry and Rich Daiwadi and uh, people of that ilk in it. Okay. And it's like a hospital spoof yes, drama thing. Yes, the in the hospital. It's really funny. Okay, it's very have, good. Okay, I'm going to have... It's on I Channel love, 4. I love a good British comedy show. I'll have a look at that. Okay. Which Friends character would you be if you have seen the show or if you like it? Um, uh, Chandler. Uh, witty and sarcastic. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Um, favorite place you've ever been to? Oh, that's a good question. I'm gonna say Japan, just because it's the most recent place I've been to. Oh, what is the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Uh, a sea urchin. Okay. What was the last book you read? Uh, Cloud Atlas. Was it good? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was all right. I didn't love it. What is your biggest addiction? Um, I don't think I have one. That's a thing in moderation. You're a level-headed person. I don't know. Maybe I have got one. It's just not. I'm not. It's not occurring to me. What is the most interesting thing you own? Interesting thing that I own. Mm. Um, I've got a taxidermied mouse on my window ledge that I made. That is. That you made? I made it, yeah. It's awful, it's horrifying. It, like, it looks dreadful. It? I went to a taxidermy class, this was like last January. Uh, started off really strong, was very good at skinning the mouse. Stuffing it went ho like awfully wrong. And was, now it just looks... Was that a gift? a gift? It was a gift, yeah. My sister got me a voucher to go to this class. Wow. Um, I thought I was going to do better than I did. It's now awful, but it's got quite a price on my window ledge. What was the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? Oh, God. I mean, that, that's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I do. I'm quite a planner. I plan in advance. Yeah. I don't do anything super spontaneous. 
Um, what unless, is the most you? Okay, no. Good. No, unless I've had too much to drink and then it all goes. You know, can't comment on that. <laughs> Uh, what is the most used app on your phone? Um, City Mapper. Oh, probably. City Mapper. Yeah. Same. Same. Okay. Um, what do you do outside of work? Taxi <laughs> driving. <laughs> uh, I do um, Irish dancing. Um, oh. Trying to do yoga. I'm trying to be a yoga person. Not. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm getting better, but I'm still not. Can't do a handstand. Cut a position. The lying down ones. Just breathing and lying down <laughs> is fine. Anything that involves any kind of upper body strength or coordination is not really my area. But I'm trying to be more zen. Okay, that's good. At least you're trying. In one sentence, how would you sum up the internet? The internet. Mm -hmm. Dark place. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather be 10 minutes late or 20 minutes early? 10 minutes late. <laughs> uh, okay, our last question. Okay, this is kind of like a big question. Okay. Sometimes people get like really... I'm just going to say it. Okay. Would you rather have no teeth or no fingernails? Um, no fingernails. Yeah. Because yeah. teeth, because I... Want to eat? How do you eat? And that's one of yeah, life's greatest pleasures. Yeah, sure. C-sabs, no one's Yeah, but I mean dentures. Oh, you have the option to have false teeth. Yeah, but no, then you have the no. options to have. No, but <laughs> you can't change them. <laughs> but there's no alternative for for like false nails. You can't. You can't put like. I I feel like fingernails are one of those things though where you kind of think, yeah, I can get by without those. And it's yeah, only I if you lost them that you would realise actually how much stuff you need them for. For the benefit of the podcast, uh, Neve has actually very nice manicure. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, spent a lot of money on them, so thanks for noticing that. <laughs> on a um, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd look my best for this audio <laughs> medium. And that's a wrap. Be sure to check out some of our other episodes. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.